Hey folks, Dr. Mike Isertel here for Renaissance Periodization, RP Plus, and RP University. Going to talk to you about muscle gain nutrition. This is the first lecture in multiple lectures, I think eight, in a course dedicated, designed exclusively to talk about nutrition for muscle gain. Not training for muscle gain, not nutrition for fat loss, not general nutrition, nutrition just for muscle gain. So it's super specific. It's really up there in that course hierarchy. It's one of the more advanced courses. It's not necessarily advanced because it's super difficult concepts, but the thing about this course is that we're going to be relying on your knowledge of plenty of the basics. Now, if you watch this lecture, you know, several months to years from when it was recorded and we already have the RPU architecture built in, you probably won't get to this lecture or probably should sort of be wary about getting to it before you take the nutrition basics course at the very least. Just sort of know that this course is going to rely on those fundamental concepts. And there's nothing super crazy we're teaching in that basic nutrition course. You might have already enough knowledge without taking the course to get a lot out of this. So this is not like a scare tactic of you have to do the basic nutrition course or else, and you have to wait until we upload that course until you get to these. It's not like that. It's just ideally take the basic nutrition course first or second in a second position uh, next to ideal is coming in here with some pretty good nutrition knowledge. The reason is we're going to talk about just nutrition for muscle gain. We're already going to assume a bunch of stuff that you know pretty much every basic nutritional concept. We're not going to define calories here. We're not going to define carbs, proteins, fats. We're not going to talk about what the standard intakes of those are. We're not going to describe meal timing uh, in, in its sort of original form of like nutrient timing, why, when, where, how. All that theory and basics is stuff you should already know. If you know it, this course is going to be super awesome. If you don't, some of the stuff could just be a little bit confusing. So just a word to the wise, uh, make sure you, you got uh, most of your basic nutrition stuff together, and then you'll get the most out of this course. So nutrition for muscle gain, what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to talk about first about what muscle gain actually aims to do. Like what are we saying when we mean muscle gain and what is the actual result? We're going to talk about the basic mechanisms of gaining, like how it actually muscle gain is put onto the body. So there's some interesting implications there. We're going to talk about reasons why you would gain muscle or want to gain muscle, and we're going to talk about its benefits. So if you're getting to this uh, course, not because you super want to gain muscle yourself, but maybe you want to familiarize uh, yourself with muscle gains. Maybe you coach clients that want to gain muscle and you want to do a good job with them. And you yourself maybe are more into staying leaner and staying uh, smaller and more athletic. And maybe you've never really done dedicated muscle gain nutrition. This could teach you some of the reasons and benefits that maybe you could say, oh, gee, my, my other clients could really benefit from this. And maybe I could even benefit from, from some muscle gain myself. On the other side, the next point we're going to talk about is trade-offs and downsides of muscle gain. Because muscle gain is a good thing, but there's no such thing as an infinitely good thing. All good things eventually become neutral things, and uh, all neutral things eventually, if you get more of that good thing, become bad things. So there's a way to get uh, muscle gain that uh, has some costs and downsides to it. We're going to talk about the general nutritional approaches that we'll see unfolding in uh, the next multiple lectures, kind of paint a very broad uh, brush around, okay, what is muscle gain nutrition really? So kind of what we're expecting in the future for these um, sorts of interventions. And then we're going to talk about something really important. And this again goes back to communicating things with your clients and with yourself on expectations in you know, the typical time courses of muscle gain and uh, how long you have to apply these nutritional strategies for. We're, we're going to talk about how muscle gain, it doesn't take a day, it doesn't take a week, it doesn't even take a month, it takes longer. So we'll, we'll definitely have a lot to say there. Very, very important because like, you know, you could have all the things you're doing properly in muscle gain, not do them long enough, and it just won't be very productive for you. And then we're going to talk about, lastly, what's ahead, what kind of stuff we can look for in the upcoming lectures on this topic. All right. So without further ado, next slide up is what muscle gain aims to do. Well, pretty simple. We're aiming to add the amount of skeletal muscle tissue you have. Now, interestingly enough, you have two other kinds of muscle tissue, cardiac muscle, which is your heart. You don't necessarily want to make that bigger and smooth muscle, which uh, lines all of your organs and your blood vessels and stuff like that. Uh, very different kind of muscle. Skeletal muscle tissue is what we're looking to add. And you know, clearly, unless you want to look like me and have the weird jaw things going on, uh, you probably want to add skeletal muscle 
you know, uh, below your face, right? And there's various other skeletal muscles. You know, you don't necessarily want like hypertrophied hands or something like that or really big tibialis anteriors. So a lot of times it's the skeletal muscles that are involved in either physique or in moving sort of really big weights, really big joints around, right? The way we're going to do this is by uh, a couple of combinations of factors. One is by making individual muscle cells bigger, right? So the muscle cell is uh, literally just a cell in the body and it has contractile properties. So it can contract. It's anchored to one part of a muscle or tendon and it's anchored to another one. And so when it contracts, it brings uh, those tissues closer together. And when uh, thousands of muscle cells all do that, it brings the joints closer together or the, the bones of the joint. And uh, that's how movement happens, right? So we want to make individual cells bigger. That's called technically hypertrophy. That's how it occurs. But in a sense, we're also going to be adding cells, not cells themselves with all of the components, not independent cells that have their own membrane, but we're taking cell nuclei that sit dormantly outside of muscle fibers called satellite cells, and they're literally just the nuclei, the control center of the cells, and they just sit there and they have the little membrane and they don't really do a whole lot, right? Um, so they're kind of senescent, right? They're kind of just like uh, sort of half asleep. And they don't produce any force for contraction or anything like that. But when muscles get big enough, right, they enter what's called their myonuclear domain ceiling. So when your cells, you got the nucleus and you got your cell and all the muscle contractile proteins around that that actually make and contract. When the muscle cell gets big enough, the nucleus gets far enough away from the very ends of it to where it can't... Um, basically control the cell and support the cell's function in a timely manner. It's almost like having, you know, like a, like a galactic empire, but you don't have light speed travel. So you're like, okay, my empire is, you know, it's like a million light years across. And someone's like, okay, so what if there's a revolution at the star system all the way at the end? You're like, oh, you know, well, it's going to take us a like hundred million years to get over there, even at light speed. And we can't even go that fast. So the question is like, how in control are you of that? You know, there could, there could be a, an empire that takes control of half your star systems. You wouldn't even find out about it un until hundreds of millions of years ago. Does that make sense? So it's kind of like if your nucleus is, it stays a certain size, I don't know, your nucleus, nuclei don't really grow. If the muscle cell gets big enough, it stops being able to be properly controlled, which really would potentially lead to poor repair, poor function, and all this other bad stuff. So what happens is when your muscle cells get big enough, the satellite cell nuclei are pushed into the muscle cell. So you're technically not adding cells, but you're adding nuclei. It gets pushed in and all of a sudden this nucleus now controls this region of the cell. So now that part can get bigger, 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 and so on. So that's called, um, you know, satellite cell integration. And that's when those satellite cells are kind of dormant cells around the muscle cell come in only every now and again when they're needed as a part of the long-term training process. So not only are muscle cells getting bigger, but they're importing nuclei in order to make that process efficient and and effective and sort of continually, uh, 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 you know, on track. I will say this, probably one of the genetic limiting factors in how big you can ever get uh, is determined by how many satellite cells you have that are dormant. Like once you run out of satellite cells to integrate, once you get to a very low number, gee, you know, you hit your myonuclear domain ceiling, the amount of cell volume you can control, and there's just not really anything to do after that. Your muscles probably just won't get any bigger. So that's a, a really interesting fact. Is why is that guy training for 10 years? He's like 280 pounds. And why is that guy training for 10 years? He's 180 pounds. Well, it might come down to a variety of factors, including um, the fact that that person just had more satellite cells, a bigger satellite cell pool, so it's called. So when you read the research articles, that's what they're talking about, right? All right. Really, to be super clear, because this is a really common misconception, and most of you folks coming in here uh, have probably seen this somewhere else. Um, you don't turn, um, this actually, uh, unfortunately there's a, um, a typo here, uh, on your slides. Hopefully I'll fix it by the time we get it up, but, um, you don't turn, uh, fat into muscle. This is not what happens. How do people come up with a notion? Well, they see someone who's like, you know, who's like have a pretty decent level of body fat and sort of untrained. And that person starts lifting weights. And, you know, does it for a year or two, and then they see that the, the third party, like at a high school graduation or something, or like a, like a reunion or something, and all of a sudden, you know, they, they, they weighed 180 before, but except with, you know, 25% body fat, and now they weigh 180 with 10% body fat years later, and, and that person goes, oh my god, like they turned all their muscle uh, or their fat into muscle. Well, like, that doesn't make any sense because they're completely different tissues, right? Um Different tissues are structured entirely differently. And that's not actually what happens in the body. 
You can no more turn fat into muscle than you can turn your liver into your kidneys. It's two literally different types of cells. You know, you don't turn your brain into bone or the other way around, right? That, that That's really, really nonsensical. But what is happening there? Well, what's happening is the person's muscle mass grows while their fat mass shrinks, right? They used to be mostly fat, now they're mostly muscle. So that's what really happens. But, you know, you'll still hear this verbiage uh, expounded in, in gyms and, and conversations all across the world. Like, oh man, you really, you know, like supplements will advertise this, like the really shady ones online, like turn your fat into muscle. It's like, yeah, that's not how that works. And, you know, people will retire from bodybuilding or being professional athletes. And uh, people will say like, uh, for example, they'll see a big guy and be like, but like when you stop lifting, doesn't it all turn to fat? Like, yep, you're right. My muscle magically turns to fat. Like my liver's turning into my kidneys, my blood's turning into my spleen. That's insane, right? So why do people when they quit bodybuilding, sometimes get fat. Well, because they still eat like their bodybuilders or that same level of calories, but they no longer train with weights. They grow fat, shrink muscle, and that's the result. So very, very clear to make sure to, to get that. So that, it doesn't even rise to the level of a proper myth, <laughs> right? It's just one of those things that's so, so stupid. We just got to get rid of it right away, right? Now, there's different kinds of reasons uh, there's different benefits of muscle we'll talk about later, but there's very distinct reasons why people aim to gain muscle in the first place. One of the sort of more classic ones is to try to increase performance, right? So you are want to be stronger for volleyball because you want to hit the ball harder, and hitting it harder makes it go faster. And if you're strong, your accuracy actually improves to a certain extent. So you want to put on muscle so the muscle can be stronger and, you know, added muscle gains always reflect themselves in higher strength levels, especially once the nervous system has figured out how to use that new muscle uh, efficiently. And so a lot of times people are focusing on putting on muscle in order to actually improve in sport. This happens in CrossFit, this happens in weightlifting, powerlifting, wrestling, every sport you can think of, there's a time and a place to put on muscle to get better for the sport. Super, super obvious, right? The next one, which a lot of people uh, use as their reason, is to gain muscle uh, because they're focused on physique, right? They're just looking for a certain look. Now, there's different kinds of physique pursuit. You could look like a professional bodybuilder is just jacked and has got muscles coming out of their eyes. You could look like a physique model where it's, you know, sort of more tasteful muscle in various areas. Uh, or you can, you know, uh, look for a variety of things, especially maybe get super lean, but you don't want to look skinny, so you want to have some muscle, so on and so forth. So it's totally fine to train for physique. And a lot of people probably most of the people in the modern world that try to put on muscle is almost exclusively physique uh, based and, and not really performance based. Now, uh, in physique and performance, we can actually focus our muscle gains to particular body parts, right? So, uh, you know, if you're a thrower, a shot putter, and your upper body is really weak and kind of small, but your legs are super strong, when you gain muscle, you don't have to gain it everywhere, right? Because at some point, your upper body is just really limiting you. What you can do is by training the upper body more, and maybe training the legs a little less, you can gain more upper body mass, more mass in the triceps and the shoulder, so on and so forth, versus mass in the quads. So it can be body part specific. So so people don't have to say to you, hey, I want to get bigger, period. Like say, I want bigger arms, I want bigger chest, I want bigger back. Uh, or they say, hey, look, I want much bigger legs, but I don't want a big upper body. And that's totally fine. Now, interestingly enough, um, that is all training based and is zero nutrition based. So nutrition, all it does is it sort of primes the pump for muscle growth and it supplies the raw materials. Where you choose to put those raw materials, that's up to you. So if we're like building a skyscraper and we want to build, you know, uh, work on like one side to make it taller or another side to make it taller, put a spire on top, you know, they still bring the same building materials more or less to the site. Right. It's not like you can ask the truck driver that brings the bricks or, you know, the metal or the steel and be like, hey, is this, you know, what's this for? Like, is this for the, the spire or is this for the base? And he's going to be like, I don't, I don't know. I just like they just pay me to bring the stuff. Right. That's how nutrition is. It brings the calories, the protein, carbs, fat, so on and so forth, supplies it. And then what you train really determines what you build. So I've actually received questions like this, like, you know, is there any kind of nutritional tips for like putting muscle on my legs, but not on my upper body? That's like uh impossible. There's, there's no way that can happen with human physiology because primary reason, as soon as your intestines uh, have digested various materials and release them in the bloodstream, that bloodstream goes to systemic, right? It's systemic circulation. So it goes everywhere, right? So if you apply, uh, supply a higher level of protein and carbohydrate 
to your body from your diet, it really just goes to all the muscles. Now, the muscles that are more sensitive for it are the ones you've trained. So if you're not training your upper body at all, like it's going to see the carbs and protein and be like, ah, all right, so you can just take some, leave some. But if your legs are super well trained and super hungry for that stuff, they're going to use it more for muscle growth. So it's almost entirely training on that. And technically speaking, you can focus on regions of muscle that you want to grow. So it's a more limited scope. We're not really sure how much regional hypertrophy is possible. For example, can you focus to make like, to get your peak of your biceps bigger versus like, you know, elongating the muscle all across its length and making it bigger like that? Maybe, maybe, but we definitely know some muscles distinctly have parts to them. The upper pecs, for example, you can do in various incline movements and upper uh, other upper chest movements that grow your upper pecs a bunch, but maybe your lower pecs not so much, right? So there's definitely uh, regional differences. They're still trying to figure out the quads, right, with how you grow regional differences. A lot of debate about that's not really certain. But, you know, the triceps, uh, for example, have very distinct heads. You know, if you train overhead a lot, the long head gets stimulated more because it's stretch under tension. And if you bring your triceps down closer to your body, you do presses this way or push downs that way, the other heads of the triceps seem to receive more work and probably grow more. So it's definitely a regional thing. It's just, um, I wouldn't put too much stock in that because it's probably not a huge difference. Um, and, uh, you know, more particularly, let's put this out there right now. This is a little more training related, but I think it bears repeating. You know, if you have really small arms and you're trying to focus on regional differences, like I just want a bicep peak, like you don't really have a bicep to talk about, right? So the basic approach is to getting much bigger muscles first, right? All around. And then maybe you can sort of whittle away at trying to shape the thing. Right, it's kind of like building something from clay. You big big slab first, and then you start whittling away at it. You don't like whittle away and add slabs and whittle away. That doesn't make much sense. All right, so those are our goals potentially, and you may fall into any number of them or different goals at different times. What are the basic mechanisms by which this happens? Real basic stuff. Right. This is not a course on mechanisms of muscle gain. It's nutrition for muscle gain. So we just have to get familiar enough with the mechanisms to basically find an alignment where we can say, okay, this is the basics of how muscle grows, thus nutrition should probably look like this. Versus if this is the basics of how muscle grows, nutrition I, might not look like this. Here's a real stupid analogy I just made up. And if, if we know that we're launching a rocket into, or taking a, well, let's say a, like a new shuttle type of system, like a high altitude shuttle, we're going into 100,000 feet above the air and we're gonna go to Hong Kong like that from Los Angeles. Like if the, uh, you know, we don't have to know exactly, uh, like if we're engineering the, uh, you know, the exterior of the shuttle or something or the pressure systems, we don't have to know exactly, you know, uh, you know, uh, maybe the trajectory, we don't have to know exactly what the power plant is, how the shuttle actually flies, how many people are in there, and if they know that stuff, we just have to know that it goes at altitude so we can uh, pressurize it and make it structurally stable so that it can uh, withstand the nasty weather conditions and various environmental factors at 100,000 feet. That's just all we have to know. We have to know where it goes, right? Whereas if we're saying designing a similar shuttle that goes, uh, you know, deep, deep under the sea into various trenches, well, boy, that's really Really, like, again, we don't really care what the power system is. We don't really care what the computer system is. That doesn't really matter. But we want to design the exterior of the shuttle to make sure that it can go super, super deep. That's what's relevant to us. So what's relevant to designing nutrition for muscle gain isn't exactly the specifics of cell mechanisms, all that stuff. It's the general swaths, the, the approaches that make sure that we're on the right track for nutrition that we care about. So without further ado, two super important concepts that are going to guide a whole lot of this discussion. FSR stands for fractional synthetic rate. Okay, and fractional synthetic rate is the measured rate of muscle growth. All right? That's it. Right? It's literally measuring how much muscle you put on per minute, per hour, per day, per week, whatever. FSR is the literal measured rate of muscle growth, usually in a specific muscle. All right? Counter that with the FBR, which is the fractional breakdown rate. That's how much of the muscle gets broken down, right, and deleted, 
right, chopped up into amino acids and, and, and shuttled to other uses, how often does that happen? Because remember, muscles don't just grow, muscles get broken down all the time. They don't just get broken down through training, they get broken down to be used as fuel for other things, right? Uh, for calories, for amino acids to go to other organs that are more important. You know, if you like get lost in Alaska somewhere for a couple of weeks, you might be pretty jacked to start. You're not going to be nearly as jacked when they when they find you, you know, huddled up with a bear or something two weeks later because you're going to have used a lot of that muscle to fuel not only your caloric needs for your energy systems, but also to get the amino acids to where they need to go, like you know, keeping your intestines healthy and keeping your brain and heart healthy. Way more important than being jacked, right? So muscles definitely break down and they kind of break down all the time. They're no different than skin and hair. You just lose that stuff and regrow it all the time. Muscles are the same way. So there's always a fractional synthetic rate and a fractional breakdown rate. And that's called muscle protein turnover, right? It's a cycle all the time. You're adding new, you're taking away, adding new, you're taking away. It's kind of like, actually, here's a really good analogy. Um, uh, you take a look at a city, a whole city at the same time, not any particular building. Just look at a whole city. You can ask, you know, someone who's an expert on that city, let's say New York City. You can point down to it from a dirigible, of course. You're flying in a, in a you know, your 1920s baron and you're like, man, see, that's my New York City down there. Yeah. Right. You talk like that all the time. People think it's weird. So you point down and you say, hey, are there any new buildings being constructed? And they'll be like, of course. I'm like, great. That's great. So it's getting bigger all the time. And they're like, yeah, yeah, it's getting bigger. We're like, are there any buildings being demolished? And people would be like, yeah, absolutely, like weekly. And you'd be like, oh my God, well, that's ridiculous. Why would we demolish buildings? Don't we want the city to grow? And you're like, well, yeah, but some of those buildings are getting to be where they're not safe anymore, too many cracks. And that's a lot of the reason why muscle gets broken down and rebuilt is to keep that muscle integral integrally very strong. Right? You want to keep it healthy and functioning properly, which means all of its components need to not be degraded. And every system degrades, so it has to be reconstructed over time. Right, So it would be really ridiculous to be like, well, why are they demolishing that building? Can't, can't people make use of it? Well, yeah, but not very safely. Right, and Not much use to be just abandoned building with holes in the floor. It's not really very conducive to much use. So there's always a cycle of create of creation of fractional synthesis on a city where new buildings are getting made buildings are getting refurbished and other buildings that are getting broken down what happens when they get broken down well you take all the bricks and stuff like that you send it to various recycling centers or smelting centers you get whatever you can out of it and then you potentially use at least some of that to build new buildings but you can't do all of that. It's not a perfect system. So the city needs to import raw building materials all the time to actually get net growth, right? And how does a city get net growth? Its building construction has to outpace its building demolition. In just the same way, when your fractional synthetic rate of muscle tissue is higher on average than your fractional breakdown rate over days, month, or days, weeks, and months, that is how you make muscle gains. Am I going to say it's that simple? It's not. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but at minimum, this has to happen. I'll put it to you this way. If we say a bunch of other complicated stuff is happening and fractional synthetic rate is greater than fractional breakdown rate, we're good to go. We're building muscle, potentially. But if all this complex, weird muscle growth stuff is happening, we'll talk about a little bit of what that means, but fractional synthetic rate is not exceeding fractional breakdown rate, you get no muscle growth whatsoever. It's physically impossible by definition. So number one concern for growing muscle is that the fractional synthetic rate is greater than the fractional breakdown rate. Another way to put that is right? Mind-blowing implication. Nutritionally and through training and otherwise, we're going to have to do things that boost the fractional synthetic rate, the construction of muscle, and things that maybe mitigate at least needless fractional breakdown, right? For example, if you have no laws about property destruction in a city, people will just go break stuff because it's not illegal. Like, it's fun. Let's just demolish that building. Like, there's cops are looking at you and they're like, yeah, it's totally cool. Right? If we have that law in effect, or rather no law, we're going to see a lot of breakdown in cities that just like doesn't make any sense. Right? Those are fine buildings. So we're going to want to reduce the sort of needless fractional breakdown. Now, of course, we can't prevent muscle turnover, but if we boost our fractional synthetic rate high enough and get rid of enough needless fractional breakdown, then we can have a net positive and a pro it's called a positive protein balance, and then we're actually getting muscle growth. So really, really good stuff. So higher, high, high uh, fractional synthetic rate is the goal, a lower fractional breakdown rate. 
What are some contributors to a high fractional synthetic rate? Well, there's a couple. Number one, a prerequisite in most cases, if you want to get real big, is resistance training. Now look, your RP Plus, your RP University folks, I have to tell you, you have to lift weights to gain muscle. If I do, we're in real, we're in real deep shit, <laughs> right? You got to go back and rewatch some lectures. So gaining uh, muscle is sort of predicated on supplying the mechanical stimulus for muscle gain. And that means resistance training. But a very specific kind of resistance training is best. That's resistance training above minimum effective volume. You have to have enough volume, right, enough sets and reps to actually trigger hypertrophy. Now, of course, that means that you can't train super light either because, you know, running distance is a ton of volume, but it's not heavy enough. So it's got to be like a challenging one to 30 reps per set. So you can gain some muscle if you just do singles. It's true. Like at 95% one rep, you can. It's not very efficient, but you can do it. And you can gain plenty of muscle training with sets, you know, close to a 30 rep max, right? Like sets of 25, 23, but like a couple of reps from failure. You can gain it. Maybe not also super efficient, but somewhere in that range, anywhere outside of that range, we're not really gaining a whole lot of muscle. And another really quick thing about training, just to put this sort of a stone in the framework is it has to probably be uh, four repetitions in reserve or less to be the most efficient, most effective. What that means is this. If you do a set and you end like this and you rack it and you're like, hey, I'm growing muscle, like you're probably not. You're just not challenging your physiology enough. If you get closer to failure, so maybe four reps away, you're like, Ugh, rack. Like you had four more in the tank, that's some good muscle growth. Three reps in the tank, great. Two reps in the tank, great. One rep in the tank, awesome. You know, going straight to failure definitely grows muscle. There's fatigue concerns there outside the scope of this course. But basically, training has to be enough training. It's got to be heavy enough. And it's a pretty broad range. And it has to be challenging enough relative to your own abilities, right? So train, train hard. Next, you have to have enough protein. That's the, probably the second most important factor because even in the absence of a high calorie diet, in many cases, you can gain uh, contractile tissue, you can gain muscle just by having a high level of protein and hard enough training. You basically use your fat for energy and your body fat reduces while your muscle grows. I mean, you, can you get away with that for long? No. Is it impressive growth? No, but it's technically possible. On the other hand, even if you supply a crap load of calories, but you're on like 20 grams of protein per day, it really just doesn't matter how many calories you eat because you are never going to grow muscle on fat few grams of protein a day. It's just not going to happen. It's just not enough raw materials, right? An analogy there to bring in a lot of calories in with not a lot of protein is if you bring in like hundreds of thousands of unbelievably qualified workers and engineers to build a skyscraper, right? The calories, so to speak. And uh, none of the materials trucks ever show up. Or it's a skyscraper that's a hundred trucks of materials to deliver all of it and 20 of the trucks show up. And you're like, you guys are good, right? Like, what do you mean we're good? This is crazy. There's 20 trucks here, right? And they're like, well, it's good enough. I'm like, no, that's good enough to build the quarters for where we're going to sleep. It was not even enough to build anything of the skyscraper. Like, all right, that's all you get, right? So protein is definitely important. Calories are our second um, in, in a consideration for muscle growth. Now, nutrient timing. And uh, other smaller factors definitely have their place. I don't want to say they're important, but they have their place, especially, and this is a really, really big point, as you get more advanced, the way to boost your fractional synthetic rate is to do so through the more nitty gritty strategies because you're already doing the basics correctly and because muscle growth is not really difficult for you. It does not just something that just so you sort of open your eyes, close your eyes and boom, there's muscle. It's going to have to require a little bit more focus, right? Uh, to get someone who's never driven a race car to post a lap time, right? You just got to teach them how to steer the steering wheel and you don't even teach them the gears about like, here in first gear, just go around in first gear, right? Uh, but if you're a good race car driver, you're going to have to know how to work the gear shift pretty well and how to work the steering wheel and everything. If you're a world champion, a race car driver or real close, you're super competitive. Um, you got to really learn how to align the car and cut the tiniest little corners and really work the clutch and the acceleration to get the little bits. Now, you do have to teach someone to do clutch and acceleration stuff when they just post any lap time at all. As if you just go around the track one fucking time, you're good to go. Of course not, right? So if you talk about muscle growth nutrition for beginners, do they have to worry about nutrient timing and other small factors much? Not really, right? Uh, but if you're more intermediate advanced and the muscle gains just aren't coming in like they used to, you're going to have to concern yourself with this stuff. Now, lastly, here's two big, really big factors that I think play a huge role. Lower fatigue states are more conducive to muscle growth. What does that mean? If you've got a lot of fatigue coming in through stress at work, through emotional stress, and for example, through other training, <clears throat> like you just also happen to be a hockey player and you're trying to get jacked at the same time, but you play like 18 hours of hockey a week. That's a lot of fatigue. Fatigue at the very 
chemical level, a biochemical level, through a variety of mechanisms, including AMP kinase, for example, literally turns down muscle growth like like a like a knob switch. All right. So a high level of fatigue is not great because a lot of people come to us at, at RP, and I'm sure you folks here are trained other people that are listening to this. If I clients like this, they can do 50 other trillion things, a bunch of athletic things. Like I do golf, I do tennis, I do skiing. I have I'm in a soccer league and this and that. I'm always on the go. I, I you know go to yoga classes. I cycle all the time, and also I want to put on 10 pounds of muscle. You're like, all right, good luck getting the muscle to compete with that kind of attention, right? So high fatigue state, really, really bad. And this is a killer of many, many muscle gains. Inadequate sleep, a high level of sleep is super critical to muscle gains to the point where they've shown, and this is really kind of crazy, they've shown that underslept individuals lose muscle at rates that actually just legitimately look really astonishing, scary. Is some of that probably due to body water loss? Yeah. But is there still something there? Totally. Right? The amount of recovery you get from sleep is just second to none. Sleep is irreplaceable. Why am I mentioning this so early? A lot of folks want the details, and trust me, you'll get them. We've got another seven lectures or something like that. Details of nutrition for muscle gain. And they'll sort of fiddle around as, should I be eating 0.9 grams of protein per pound body weight, 1.1 maybe, somewhere in between? Hold on. How many hours of sleep do you get a night? They're like, well, six maybe. And then you ask them the next most pertinent question. Are you tired a lot? They're like, oh my God, Like, if you just let me sleep, I'll sleep for like a day and a half. That's not good. That is not sustainable. And that is going to hit your muscle growth so much harder than any tiny details. Try to get as low a fatigue state as you can. Try to get as much sleep as you can. You're promoting fractional synthetic rate a ton. Add the little small factors, calories, protein, proper resistance training. You have a formula for success. Next up is how do we make sure the fractional breakdown rate is the lowest it can be? Well, all the same above things, lower fractional breakdown rate. Training enough enough protein, enough calories, nutrient timing and smaller factors, like what kind of food you're eating, low fatigue and high sleep, lower fractional breakdown rate, like crazy. So it's really same side uh, or different side of the same coin. One factor that potentiates uh, really helps lower fractional breakdown rate that it deserves mention is actually higher carbohydrate. Carbohydrate um, after you get in enough protein, has a very special anti-catabolic uh, activity uh, or effect on muscle tissue. So in other words, carbs have been described as protein sparing. Let's see if you have a higher carb diet and you're eating plenty of protein, your body's hungry. It's going to go, uh, uh, should I eat my muscle? Should I eat the protein that I ate? Oh, wait, there's carbs coming in. It just eats the carbs preferentially. It doesn't touch your muscle protein and it doesn't touch the protein that you ate. That protein goes much more to uh, where it needs to be, like growing muscle. So another really powerful tool there is higher carbohydrate diet, which is almost a universal in muscle gain protocols, right? Um, I know there's like a channel on YouTube where the guy's called, it's called Keto Gains or something. I don't know. Uh, you can try to gain muscle on a low-carb diet. It's really, really tough for a variety of reasons. One of those is the higher carbs are so anti-catabolic. All right. So to put, so sum this up, basic mechanism of gaining, we can make a real quick summary. TLDR, you basically fuel up for training by eating properly, you train hard, you eat, 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 rest, sleep, repeat, grow muscle, right? That's how it works. So what are some of the reasons potentially, and especially the benefits you could get from gaining muscle? Well, there's quite a few. One, incontrovertibly, more muscle makes you stronger, right? When we increase the cross-sectional area, like if you slice a bicep like, like that, you examine how big the area is, right? It's just a measurement of muscle size. Cross-sectional area has a really, really tight relationship to force production in every way we measure it, in real life humans, in animals, in the laboratory, even one muscle fiber, one cell at a time. They take a muscle cell, they put it on one little pin, one end, they put the other end on one little pin, and they put an electrode here, and they make it contract. And the bigger the muscle cell they get, the more force it produces. I mean, it's not rocket science, right? Because the stuff in the muscle cell is the literal machinery for force production. And that's how you should look at muscle as machinery for force production. So you see a, someone that's really jacked and you're like, oh, I wonder if they're strong. Well, how much machinery for force production do they have? Well, it looks like a shitload. It looks like they're probably going to be really strong. So definitely strength enhancement is a really good benefit of muscle gain. Because strength is enhanced and power is basically an expression of strength at high velocities, but how fast are you at expressing your strength? 
then as long as you don't get slower, and we'll talk about later in downsides, uh, and most muscle gains don't make you slower, especially if you train properly, then just getting stronger actually makes you more powerful. It means that with gains in muscle, to a point, you can jump higher, run faster, hit harder, throw harder, so on and so forth. Real good stuff, right? Because power, or the ability to contract a muscle very quickly, produces speed, Getting stronger to a point, getting bigger to a point, makes you faster. Now, there says to a point, um, what's that point? Well, power to weight ratios are a thing, right? For example, if you're a high-level sprinter and you're maybe 5'10", 5'11", sort of average sprinter height, if you're like 140 pounds, you don't have enough muscle to move all of your bones and and other structures enough, so you're not going to be as fast as you could be. As you gain muscle to 150 pounds, 160 pounds, your power goes up more than your body weight does in a relationship scale. So your power multiplies by more than a factor of one, but your weight goes up by a factor of one. So your power to weight ratio improves. Now, uh, if you gain, you know, 170, 180, 190, 200, 210, you're now gaining so much muscle that your power to weight ratio, your weight's starting to really be a burden. Your power to weight ratio starts to sort of flatline and then fall off again, and then you can no longer be faster, right? Which is why in the National Football League, for example, you see folks weighing, you know, 180 pounds, 190 pounds, 200 pounds. They're the fastest people on the team. Folks that are, you know, 210, 220, 230, they can be really, really super fast, especially if short distances. But then you get into 260, 270, all the way up to, you know, three. 350 pounds, those folks just are not as fast because they have a ton of power, but their weight is starting to be a burden. So as long as your power to weight ratio works out and you're really training your technique for speed, more muscle can make you faster. Absolutely. Right. And of course, it can also, for all those reasons, make you more explosive. Here's another cool benefit of muscle gain. Muscle gain makes you more injury prone. A lot of the reason why people get injuries is because their joints aren't stable enough and large muscles help stabilize joints. And also because they're not strong enough to reduce body movements that they don't actually want to, for them to happen, right? So for example, if you're really muscular and you're really strong and you slip on ice, you can post another leg or post an arm and not fall. If you're very weak, you post a leg and your leg is so weak that it collapses and then you end up you know, hitting your head, so on and so forth. So uh, if you want to reduce injury risk, getting stronger and getting more muscular, uh, is, is definitely a good idea. I'll tell you what, you know, I do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It's a combat sport. So when people grapple with me in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you know, they look at me and not the first thought in their head is, oh boy, I'm going to get this guy hurt, <laughs> right? Their thought is, I better not get hurt by this guy, right? So when you're really muscular and, and you have more strength, it's a really kind of a pretty big insurance fat policy against injury. And they've done tons of studies, especially on folks that tend to be a little weaker. For example, uh, girls going through puberty still that get into jumping sports and they're not at full body weight and muscularity yet. A lot of the ways they get hurt is what's called non-contact injuries. Like they're so weak that when they land, their knees will collapse inwards and their knees will twist and then they get all sorts of injuries. So less injury prone is a huge factor, huge athletic reason to try to gain some muscle, right? And to a point in muscle gain, especially based on how you get there, being more muscular makes you healthier. One of the ways in which more muscle makes you healthier is this. Muscle is a giant glucose disposal machine. So you have a certain amount of blood glucose circulating and you eat a certain amount of food all the time and you do a certain level of physical activity. And if you sort of chronically overeat food and you end up secreting a lot of glucose into your blood, you know, usually all the systems take the glucose out and you don't have chronic high blood glucose, but in pre-diabetic conditions, that can be to where your blood glucose is just sort of a little too high for a little too long. And if you don't have a lot of muscle and you weigh, let's say, 100, uh, 180 pounds, then you have quite a bit of fat that it doesn't really have a really good uh, effect on blood glucose and it can have actually negative effects. And all of a sudden, you know, you're eating your normal meals and so on and so forth, and your blood glucose level starts to climb up over the years, and then you become you know, pre-diabetic, diabetic, and then that's really bad. Type 2 diabetes is very, very unhealthy, and, and pre-diabetes itself very unhealthy, if you have a lot of muscle. Every time you feed it, the muscle just gobbles up a bunch of food. It's just super hungry, and it's usually super sensitive to insulin, much more than fat uh, is, uh, you know, in, in many cases. And what it does is, you know, it eats up a ton of food, and it just makes you sort of chronically lower in blood sugar. As you get blood sugar, and especially if you're active with that muscle mass, you know, when you're active, its glycogen levels drop off, and then it's got to refill its glycogen store. So anytime... Uh, glucose comes in, it's like, oh, hey, anyone, any dibs on that? I'm going to take that. And the muscle eats it. And all of a sudden, your blood glucose levels are way under control. If you get an individual that is muscular and lean, they almost certainly have excellent blood glucose control. If they're not muscular or not lean, then you might have some problems. So it's definitely healthier, absolutely to a point. 
Um, it's also been shown, and this is a little bit of a more nuanced point, that folks who are stronger and more muscular, uh, on average, tend to live longer. And especially if you start measuring this in the 60s and 70s, they live a lot longer. So you get someone who in their 60s and 70s has a pr- pretty decent level of muscle and strength. Uh, their predicted lifespan for the next 20 years or like predicted chance of death in the next 20 years is way lower than someone who's who's already quite frail and so on and so forth. And, and it supports independent living and all that other really, really good stuff. And of course, duh, uh, muscle enhances aesthetics, right? When people look good, even in clothes, a lot of times it's because of a higher level of muscularity. So for example, you have someone that looks good in a suit. What does make someone, uh, what, what, other than really good suit tailoring, what makes someone look good in a suit? Well, they have broad shoulders and a narrow waist and they all oh, just look real dapper, right? And you know, look good in a dress. How does that work? Well, you're really sort of narrow waist and broader shoulders and, and, and wider hips. And well, how's that work? We got muscle where you want it and sort of not a lot of fat. So it really enhances aesthetics. Whatever aesthetics you're going for, muscle, because we can sort of address muscle in various areas, you can have the aesthetics you want. You know, I think I'm pr- plenty aesthetic. I'm not sure if anyone agrees with that, unfortunately. So I cry a lot when I'm at home. All right. Now, we've got to be completely honest here, right? This is RP. This is high-level thought. This is talk about trade-offs and consequences and downsides. There are some downsides of muscle gain, especially if you gain a lot of it. <clears throat> not pointing fingers at myself, but I literally just pointed a finger at myself. So clearly, I'm an example. Number one, you can become less flexible. Now, here's the thing. It takes a lot of muscle to become less flexible. But if you guys saw me earlier awkwardly trying to itch the back of my head, it's really difficult for me because the old bicep here to even reach the back of my neck a lot of times. Like I have trouble shaving because I have to do this and it's difficult to get under this area. It's really a trip, right? How jacked do you have to be? Well, I have like roughly 20 inch arms when I'm pumped and I'm like five, six. That's like kind of a nonsensical version of a human body. But, you know... If you rely on a sport in which really extreme flexibility is required, a lot of muscle isn't a good thing. Here's a really good example. If you're an Olympic weightlifter, the rack position in the clean, which I'm horribly illustrating it, I was nowhere close to doing it, is dependent upon your bicep just not being that big. And if you have a really big bicep, it screws up a rack position and really can really, can really put you off. So if you're an Olympic weightlifter and you like doing a lot of bicep curls, you got to be careful with that, especially if you start getting over 80, 90, 100 kilos in body weight. At some point, you're going to have arms that are too big to be optimal for that. More muscle can make you slower, especially if you do a couple of things. You put on a ton of muscle and you no longer train speed qualities. So if you train like a bodybuilder all the time, train for reps, train for reps, train for reps, you get really big, but you never work on the speed qualities and the athleticism, uh, speed qualities of the muscle locally or the athleticism of your body generally, and then you absolutely will get slower and then that's not going to be a really, really good thing. So for athletes, if you're looking for muscle hypertrophy to boost you in athletic ability, um, it absolutely can do that. Just make sure you're not getting so big that it doesn't make sense for your sport anymore. Like, you know, if you're a soccer player and you weigh 210 pounds, it doesn't make any sense. And also uh, make sure that you're still training your sport qualities, explosiveness, so on and so forth in a periodized manner. To that end, enough muscle can make you less explosive. This one's a little harder to pull off, but especially dynamic explosiveness and rebounding off of stuff. If you're heavy enough, it just don't you just don't rebound the same like you used to. Definitely, you get muscular enough, you can be too big at your best health. Really tough to do without taking anabolic drugs and all this other stuff, which have independent effects on your health. But I'll put it to you this way. If you reach 250 pounds body weight, fairly lean, a lot of muscle... Man, you know, unless you're really, really, really tall, weighing 250 is just a burden on you one way or the other. Now, if it's more more fat than muscle, that's definitely worse. But just having a lot of, or, of, of organ on you, of muscle, it requires more, uh, you know, uh, slightly higher blood pressure to get all the blood around. Your heart has to work harder. Your kidneys have to work a little bit harder, so on and so forth. It's not for the best. Your joints can suffer because you're walking around heavy all the time. So uh, a lot more muscle can can do some damage in that respect, right? And of course, a lot more muscle can uh, detract from the aesthetics that you might want. You might not not want to look super duper jacked. You might not want to have traps that go through the, you know, all the way up to your ear, so on and so forth. I mean, this is kind of like a um, pretty edge case here because you got to really work, sort of go out of your way a lot to work hard at getting to be more muscular. And it, it'd be strange if you went out of your way and got super jacked, and then all of a sudden you were like, oh shit, I hate this. You know, you probably would have catch, caught it along the way. But some athletes, you know, there's female throwers and stuff that maybe not want to be super huge. They want to be really good at throwing. So they got super jacked to be good at throwing. But as soon as they're done throwing, they kind of give it all up and and go and do, uh, you know, other pursuits and still train with weights may, uh, maybe, but it's not as much. And they get to a lower level of muscularity that, that they like better. Not my cup of tea, but absolutely to each their own. And um, here's the thing. In the short term especially for non-beginners, 
you're going to be expecting some fat gain with muscle gain. This is a huge point that we will belabor much more later on. But just to throw this out there in the beginning, uh, almost one of the number one deterrents for people who would benefit a lot from muscle mass gains, who wouldn't pay any of these costs listed until this one, almost the number one deterrent for those folks is they know, slash have heard, slash are under the understanding of, and this is correct, that if you're not a beginner, you, at least in the short term, months, have to get a little bit fatter to gain muscle. Now, we're not, there's no, we're not trying to get fatter, but the hypercaloric diet, the excess calories that make us the most muscular, also have the side effect of making us a little bit fatter in the short term. Now, are we talking 20% fatter? No way. We're talking about 3 5% more fat than we're normally carrying, at, and that's really at the extremes. Is that a thing? Yeah, it's a thing, right? So if you want to stay 10% or if you're female and you want to stay 16% all the time and have abs and everything, and you don't want to make the trade-off of temporarily looking just a little bit fluffier, but that's the pathway to huge lean muscle gains after, you know, yeah, it's going to be a struggle for you. But if you sort of swallow that pill and know that it's not all the time to look super lean, you're going to do super well with it. And we'll talk about that in our myths and fads, but it's definitely a downside. So, you know, uh, why are we saying this downside? Well, here's the deal. You can't tell your clients, for example, let's say you coach clients. There's a lot of the folks watching this are going to be personal trainers, uh, nutrition and diet coaches, and uh, you know weight training coaches. And you can't tell your client, hey, listen, but you know, go back a slide and be like, here's all these benefits of muscle gain. And they're like, what, what, what about the downsides? Like, ah, there are no downsides, right? If none of it, they never become more, less flexible, slower, blah, 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 all this health stuff, because it's mostly regular people. But you'd have to gain just you know like 50 pounds of muscle for any of this to be relevant, uh, even for them unless they're just rank beginners, gaining muscle is going to come in the first couple of months with some fat gain until you deal with it later. And of course you can deal with it later. And of course you can lose all the fat. And of course it doesn't affect you long-term. And of course you're going to be lean and jacked at the end of the process. But that that's a hell of a buy-in, right? That's like telling someone that college is a place where you get educated and and, and, and you tell them nothing else. And they're like, well, does it take a long time? And you're like, no, nah. you just, you're just, boom, you get an education. And they're like, okay, so where, where do I sign up? And they're like, well, here's the sign-up sheet and here's how you pick your classes. And they're like, Wait, I have to be here for four years? And you're like, well, yeah. <laughs> like, well, I don't want to have a job. I have like a family. I can't go to school for four years. Like, oh, I guess I should have told you that. That's what's one of the, you know, the trade-offs is you got to sort of delay your income for a while until you get educated, right? Same thing, right? People a lot of times want to put on muscle because they want to look better. But the path to looking better is temporarily looking not as good, maybe, right? Uh, and for some people, they don't give a shit. Like some people are like, fatter and more muscular like pff, they don't care it's all it's all gravy right uh, depending on what community you're in so on and so forth you could just be just want to be big and that's great but right, I mean, a lot of people don't want that a lot of people want the leanness and the muscularity uh, and they don't ever want any of the transitional states of higher body fat if you're going to be coaching non-beginners you have to let them know about this uh, trade-off and you have to familiarize the extent of the trade-off how to mitigate the trade-off because if you gain a little slower if you don't just stuff your face you get less fat gains it's a definitely a good thing um and uh, let them sort of come to their own conclusion with your guidance of course uh, it's okay all right i think i'm good to gain like 10 pounds of body weight and if like three or four of that is fat up front i'm okay with that and if they're okay great they're still going to require you reminding them that they say okay because you know six weeks in they're going to like sort of their abs are going to be a little blurry and they're like oh my god oh my god oh my god i can't see my abs i can't see my abs red alert <laughs> right and then you're gonna have to be like hey remember we signed up for this we know it's at the end at the end is crispy abs with five more pounds of muscle but we got to go through the so the dark forest at first uh, the dark forest of body fat it sounds kind of disgusting when you think about it. it's like fat globs on the trees right so you you just have to know what you're getting yourself into and folks you're helping they have to know what they're getting into all right with that out of the way what are the general nutritional approaches that we're going to be taking and we're going to be talking about well Big, big cornerstone is a hypercaloric diet because the whole high protein thing doesn't work super well unless you're pretty much a beginner or sort of pretty high body fat. And outside of that, it doesn't work super well. So a hypercaloric diet actually taking in more calories than you need to maintain. Pretty big cornerstone there. Enough protein because if you're taking all the calories of the world, but your protein is really low, you're not going to gain a whole lot of muscle, but you will gain a whole lot of fat. Enough carbs and fats to meet their own specific functions. So, for example, if you have enough calories and enough protein, but you don't basically are all almost completely no carb diet, it's a bad deal, right? It's a bad deal because what you end up having is um, you're not gaining nearly as much muscle as you wanted. 
because you're uh, missing out on all the good benefits of a high-carb diet that are very muscle growth orienting, like the reduced muscle catabolism, the various increased anabolism signals. We'll talk about that all later in super, super good detail. And of course, fats are essential for a variety of things, including a sort of proper hormone function. So if you drop your fat super low and you're like, I'm just going to eat protein and carbs and bulk up and just gain no fat, then you're going to gain probably not much fat, but you're probably going to gain not much of anything because your testosterone levels are going to drop so low, you're going to essentially neuter yourself, right? So you, you want to you know get enough carbs and fats to at least check the boxes. It's a lot with carbs. It's not that much with fats, but we're going to talk about those values down the line. You're going to want to do reasonable timing, right? If you eat all of your food in one meal, some of it will go to muscle and some of it will go to fat, uh, to prevention of muscle loss. But a lot of it will go to fat gain because there's only so much muscle you can grow like sort of per hour. And if you eat all of your food in one meal, you're, you're going to fill up that muscle growth per hour quota and all the rest of the protein, carbs, fats is going to go straight to fat stores. Later on, you know, does some of the fat store buildup you made earlier in the day, does it come out and supply energy reserves? Yes. But does it supply muscle growth? No. Right? There's actually no way to store protein in your body. It's either integrated into tissue like muscle, or it's just catabolized for energy right there on the spot. You can store carbs through glycogen. Yes. Can you store uh, fats through fat cells? Absolutely. Uh, but can you store protein? Not really. So the whole eat like a snake to get huge thing doesn't really work. Nutrient timing has to be reasonable, which we're going to see later is, you know, hopefully at least four meals a day. And after four, it gets a little quirky as to whether or not any more helps. But definitely anything shy of four meals a day is like uh, you're kind of not giving yourself a good run at the money, right? And food composition considerations are up next, right? These are a little smaller details now. Like exactly what are you eating for your proteins? Exactly what are you eating for your car? A really good example is it's been shown that um, high quality, complete proteins, particularly those in animal products, tend to build muscle a little better than the other kinds of proteins, particularly like, you know, plant proteins that are incomplete. So food composition, what you're actually eating matters. Are there ways to adjust that? Uh, maybe eating more protein if the protein sources aren't as uh, high quality? Yeah, absolutely. And they come with their own trade-offs. Uh, but it's definitely something we should be paying attention to, at least to some extent, right? And of course, supplements and proper hydration. Proper hydration is essential uh, to life. Um, we'll, we'll talk about what that means uh, later down the line. And of course, there are some supplements that can help you gain weight uh, and, and gain muscle. Uh, they're not like super powerful. There's a very, very small fraction of the total effect. But there's one muscle gain supplement in particular that can come in real handy if you really struggle with weight gain. And we'll talk about that one down the line, right? Now, here's a huge factor, huge factor consistency. Okay. If we take a week of your muscle gain diet and on three days of that week, you're getting a hypercaloric diet, you're nailing your protein, you got enough carbs and fats, your timing's great, food composition supplements, boom, 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 you're a machine. Sweet. But if the four other days of the week or even two other days of the week, you are just failing miserably. I mean, like under eating like crazy, let's say one meal a day of like 750 calories or a thousand calories and you're just super busy with work or with partying or whatever and the other days three days of the week you're eating through 3500 calories like you're supposed to blah 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 everything's tight man you know you're building decent muscle or sort of we'll get to this in a bit you're supplying the stimulus for good muscle growth for three days but for four days you're supplying the stimulus for really good muscle breakdown and really poor muscle growth the net balance could be that you lose muscle. And so why did you even bother with those other three days? You could have lost plenty of muscle just fine without ever you know, wasting three days uh, of your week of trying to live like a machine that gains muscle. So the consistency thing, and you can look at consistency as kind of on the measure of weeks, right? Per week, right? So for example, as coaches and, and uh, we help other people, when we try to figure out consistency, we're really trying to ask like okay, your typical week, what percent of the days slash meals are you getting correct? Right? If it's like 90%, you're doing real well for yourself. If it's like 60%, gee, you know, you could probably get a lot more muscle gain if you tried well. If it's like less than 50%, it's just not really clear you're getting any muscle gains at all, especially if you're not a ranked beginner. If you're not a beginner, man, if you're an intermediate and you've already kind of not struggled to put on muscle, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge. If you're not on the money, like most of the time, you just won't gain muscle. Your body needs a real clear message to do anything really good uh, unless it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, just, just going to stay the same, right? So consistency. Is it good to have a hypercaloric diet? Yes, but only for consistent with it. Is it good to eat enough protein? Yes, but only for consistent with it. It doesn't mean all the time. It means most of the time. 90% is a real good place to go. So for example, if you're an intermediate, 
and you have six days of great eating and one day of okay eating, you're going to gain a lot of muscle. You have six days of eating and one day of terrible eating, one, one day of terrible eating, you're going to gain plenty of muscle, but you could have gained you know, noticeably more, right? If you have, you know, four days of good eating and three days of awful eating, gee, you know, we really can't help you in that regard. So consistency is real big. It's a real big thing because a lot of people will say, you know, you'll have clients potentially and other folks come to you and say, hey, look, I want to gain muscle. I think I'm doing everything right. I don't know what I'm doing wrong because I'm not gaining a whole lot of muscle. And you know, maybe they just hit their genetic ceiling or something. You sort of get some input from them. They're like, you know, they've only been training weights for three or four years. They weigh 150 pounds, reasonably athletic in their youth. And you're like, well, seems like you should be gaining muscle, like at least pretty measurably during this time of your life. So you start going through the checklist. You're, are you eating a hypercaloric diet? Are you getting enough protein, carbs, fats, reasonable timing, blah, blah, blah. You go to the checklist and say, yes, 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 yes. And you're like straight up, you feel like, you know, Albert Einstein towards the end of his career, like you know, struggling with a the theory of everything. You're like, what the hell's going on? This shit just doesn't add up. You know, they're doing, I mean, you know, it's one of those things where you're looking for a client to just give you that one thing to be like, well, I haven't considered how much protein to eat. You're like, boom, got him, dead to rights. Like you up their protein and they just go a ton of muscle and you're like, coach, you're the best, but you can't get them on anything. You're like, gee, like, they're doing a good job of the stuff. Some of the stuff, they, they're doing better than I am, right? What the hell am I doing about it? Here's what you're missing, potentially. You say, no, nah, okay, that's great. Your diet sounds great. You've got to cut them some slack there, right? Arguing to convince. It's another series we have here. Um, you know, about how many days of the week on average do you think you're really on the money with a diet? And they'll be like, well, and that's is all you need to know right there with that answer, right? Because they're going to be like, ah, you know, four days a week, I'm definitely good. And you're like, okay. And one of the other three days. And they're like, one of those, like, if it's a weekday, it's okay. I had to get caught up in meetings. I don't eat enough. Don't eat enough. Hypercaloric diet. We're not getting much muscle anymore. And they're like, weekends are real bad, you know, because I see my kids and family more. We sort of get some food. I'm not training. I'm definitely not, you know, eating enough. It's kind of, like, pretty stressful sometimes going to, you know, dropping them off at soccer games, blah, blah, blah. And you're just, at this point, you don't even need to hear what they're saying anymore. You're like, got it. So you're not actually having a good diet consistently, right? It's not what matters. Not what matters. Uh, a good diet consistently is 50 times better than a great diet and consistently. Oh, that's how much we value consistency. Now, if we expand consistency to a larger concept, we're actually starting to talk about duration. So remember, consistency is within the week. That's how we're going to define it. Proper duration of gain is another general nutritional approach that's really important, right? Proper duration means you're giving enough time to grow actual muscle. How much muscle do you put on during a week? Well, that's actually a very difficult question to answer. You could say through fractional synthetic rate and fractional breakdown rate curves, you can actually just do the math and be like, well, it's like, you know, uh, 500 grams of muscle that you put on per week. But hold on a second. It turns out, and there's some good research to support this, that um, your FSR being greater than your FBR is important, but muscle growth is probably a lot more like building the another floor on a skyscraper than it is just adding sand to a sand pile. Because people start to look at this FSR, FBR stuff, and they start to oversimplify things and say, look, as long as you're you know, uh, fractional synthetic rate is higher than fractional breakdown rate, you're gaining muscle. Well, maybe, right? But we don't build skyscrapers by putting sand on a building and being like, that's it. That's two floors higher than it used to be. And it's like, no, there's a giant sand pile there. I want actual floors that work. I want, uh, you know, windows. I want tiling. I want roofs. I want, you know, plumbing, all that stuff. Well, how long does that stuff take to build? Well, it's not an overnight job. There's multiple systems that have to be installed. Even in building design, there's what is going to be called, we're going to introduce the concept later, called preparatory hypertrophy. If you look at a new building that's being built, um, in a lot of places, they use uh, sort of, uh, especially if it's a, let's get away, ooh, let's skyscraper, we stay, uh, stay with that. Steel struts come up first, right? And you get the outline of the building on steel struts. Steel beams basically have the, they design sort of the skeleton of the building. Now, are those steel struts actual floors yet? No. Can you put your office desk in that shit and have 80 mile an hour winds? They'd be ridiculous. It's not done. You haven't undergone building hypertrophy. That's what we'd call preparatory hypertrophy. None of the stuff that makes a building a building, like you can work in it, for example, uh, not die of freezing cold weather, actually go to the bathroom, turn on the lights, you know, the whole stuff buildings are for. None of that stuff is really there. 
the only additions have been to prepare to put that stuff under there because you can't put a wall in, you can't put a ceiling in if you uh, have no frame, for sure, right? So the frame has to be established, but that's only preparing for the actual floor to be installed, all the wires to run through, so on and so forth. Is a very, very good chance, lots of good evidence to support that this is the way muscle grows in human bodies. That it's not just a matter of pouring, like you don't slit open your, you know, forearm and pour whey protein on the shit and like, eh, stuff it in there. It should go right to my muscles. It's made of protein. That's not how it works, right? You have to do a very, very fine construction process. So for weeks of muscle growth, and we see this directly in the lab, you train, 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 you eat, 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 and it doesn't show hypertrophy quite in the same way yet eventually muscle growth starts to be noticeable on a grander scale. So we have to think that we have to have a proper duration to allow this process to actually occur. That's point number one. So these processes take way longer than we think they do. Their time course is longer. Point number two is, look, if you are saying to a client, hey, let's put on some muscle, and they're like, great, let's do it for two weeks. How much muscle can you possibly put on in two weeks? Let's say you have this just great training, this is the most sensitive person to training ever. Let's say they put on two pounds of muscle in two weeks, which would be unbelievable. You know, let's say they do that. Um, you know, what does two pounds of muscle look like on a, on a human uh, on a human body? <laughs> you like, if you're like a really good eye for stuff, you'll be able to tell, but nobody else will. It's barely anything. So a lot of people will say, hey, listen, I'm doing all the stuff right and I'm consistent. Every week I'm putting it in. And you say, well, how long are your muscle gain phases? How long at a time are you trying to gain muscle and eating hypercalorically? And they say, well, like two or three weeks at a time. And then I start to feel a little fluffier and I do a cutting phase. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Real bad idea. It's just not going to accrue a lot of muscle over time for at least those two reasons. Okay. So those that's too short. So what are the typical time courses? Right, and it seems that growing muscle is more complex, right, than it originally might look like. So it's more like adding a skyscraper floor than adding sand to a sand pile. It's it's a little bit of an endeavor that takes some time, right? There are some direct studies that show that months into a training program, the kind of growth that happens is mostly or only preparatory growth. Like you get growth of the connective tissues that sort of form the contractile elements of muscle uh, uh, of, of muscle tissue, but maybe not much of the contractile tissues themselves, right? That's kind of strange. Well, it's a big part of the process that it takes a real long time. You have to sort of build the architecture, build a skeleton of the skyscraper, and then fill it in with floors. Same idea seems to apply with muscle growth, right? Now, that doesn't mean that you don't get any noticeable gains. You get uh, sarcoplasm expands, you get more fluid in the muscle cell, so on and so forth. So you, there's still noticeable gains. You still look bigger, but they might not be permanent gains or even semi-permanent gains. Like if you stop training two months into starting training and you put on like four pounds of muscle, after two months, you might lose four pounds. And then it's like you never even gained them to begin with. It's not like two weeks later, you can pump up again and look the same. No, it's just you have to regain all that muscle because no true contractile tissue was ever even really put down in, in a large number. It was A lot of it was preparatory growth, nervous system changed, but not a whole lot happened in your actual contractile tissue construction, right? What are we going to take away from this practically? Well, less than a month of gaining probably just won't stick around not the best use of your time. A month of gaining is kind of a good analogy to that is taking a five minute nap. What the hell are you doing with a five minute nap? What's a preparatory phase in a nap? Well, the actual sleep is the muscle contraction phase, right? Or contractile protein construction phase. That's real skyscraper growth. That's real floor addition, actual sleep. But naps aren't all actual sleep, right? You lay down to go to sleep, and what happens? You don't sleep right away unless you're some kind of robot. It takes you anywhere from, you know, if, if you're really tired and is super need a nap, it could take you seconds. But a lot of times it takes you, you know, minutes, minutes to really get to go into sleep. Sometimes it can take you longer. If you get someone to take a five minute nap, they might lay down and the timer starts and they sort of scroll through Instagram a little bit. Like, oh, I got to reply to Brandon. Okay, I put the phone down. It's already been a minute and a half. And they say, oh, I wonder what my tax season is going to do. And, you know, do I really, am I really a good person or have I just bullshitting myself my whole life? Eh, I wonder. And then, and then it's three minutes and 55 seconds and you finally fall asleep. And then one, in, one minute and five seconds later, you wake up and you're like, ah, it's been five minutes. You're like, 
fuck. This is bullshit. Right? So all that's but all that stuff, all the thoughts about your taxes and whether or not you're a good person, right? Pay your taxes and you'll be a good person. Um, all that stuff is preparatory to the sleep process. I mean, nobody just like goes like this and just falls asleep, right? Like unless that was one uncle you see on Thanksgiving that does that every year, right? It's really rare to just hit it, right? So that preparatory stuff is important, but it comes sandwiched with the nap. So a five-minute nap is almost the same thing as a month of trying to gain. It's like you're just getting into things. Stuff finally starting to happen. And you're like, cut. We didn't get hardly anything done, right? How restful are you after a minute of sleep? It's barely anything, right? Another factor, on the other end, uh, well, actually, let's see. Yeah, so another factor, so, so, so a month minimum. And then what about, is there such a thing as gaining too long on a certain period of consistent gaining, right? Dedicated gaining. If you gain steadily for more than six months in many cases, uh, especially if you're not a, just a sort of a, a, a true noob, you might need a break from the fatigue of high training volumes to actually sort of get your stuff together. And you might need to take a break from the high fat gain. And we'll talk all about this stuff later in the actual parts of the course. But essentially, if you know, we do use the nap analogy, uh, six months plus of gaining is like taking a nap that's like three hours long or more, or like even an hour 50 long or more. Like after you go through one REM cycle, it's a good nap. You're pretty good to wake up. Ideally, like a 20, 30 minute nap is even better. So you don't ever run to REM sleep, but one REM cycle in, you could wake up and be pretty productive. But if you wake yourself up in the middle of a nap, like hours into the nap, boy, that's not really a nap anymore. That's kind of like your whole night's sleep and it might disrupt your night's sleep later. You might actually wake up groggier and all this other bad stuff. So it's a good thing, naps, right? And muscle growth is a good thing, but there's too much of a good thing as well. And you need breaks from various things to let things resensitize, resettle so you can have productive runs at them again. So one month or less of gaining, probably not the best idea. Six months of steady gaining or more, probably not the best idea. Why are we discussing this so early? I mean, we're going to have a whole lecture in, in part dedicated to uh, the exactitudes of, of why and how these time courses are, are extant. Why are we talking about it now? Here's why. Because you folks are getting introduced to this course. We want to know what you're getting yourself into. Right. If you're embarking on muscle growth, if you've got clients embarking on muscle growth, they say, okay, I want to put on muscle. One month, six months. You gotta to communicate to them, like, look, right, you're signing up for a commitment. It could be three or four months of dedicated hypercaloric eating and high volume training. You don't stop earlier and you don't go for longer. It's a big switch. So you know these time courses so that you can plan better, kind of know what you're getting yourself into. Final slide. What's ahead? What are we going to talk about in the various concepts, various lectures of this course? Well, we're going to talk about getting into the in, into the in the weeds. The first uh, section after this, the next lecture is going to be calories and macros for muscle gain. Okay, we want to gain muscle. How many calories should we eat? How many macros should we eat? Proteins, carbs, fats. Then we're going to have another lecture about timing, food composition, and supplements for muscle gain. Very important stuff. Then we're going to have a, a lecture about the ranges and duration for weight gain. And we say, keep saying weight gain, muscle gain, weight gain, muscle gain. How much weight are we talking about? Are we talking about five pounds a week? Are we talk about 0.1 pounds a week? And how long are we gaining weight? You know, we said it's between a month and six months, but that's a hell of a window. Maybe we can get a more precise figure and talk about why and how that would change based on certain conditions, right? Measuring progress. When we talk about muscle gain, talk about strength gain, how do we know if we're doing a good job? You know, um, in real life, you apply all of these strategies you're going to learn here, and then question mark, question mark, question mark, you gain muscle. Well, those question marks are the progress that you're actually measuring because you apply them and then you see if it's working. We'll teach you how to see if it's working. And if it's not, and potentially if it's not working super well, maybe you can change something in your game. And if it's working well, don't touch a thing, right? Or, or don't touch anything major. After that, we're going to talk about muscle gain periodization, right? Because there's a grander scope of muscle gain. We've alluded to it already a little bit, like you can't gain muscle forever, your body needs a break. We're going to see how that opens up into a very predictable periodized structure for phases of muscle gain, maybe some fat loss, maybe some maintenance. We'll talk about all that. After that, we're going to talk about, we're going to do a lecture of adjusting calories and macros when gains are not coming. So when your gains are coming good and you're doing sweet, you just keep doing what you're doing, right? But what if you're not gaining fast enough? What if you're gaining too fast and getting super fat? How do you adjust your calories? How do you adjust your macros to get you back into that sort of fine band of really good gains? Really important question. 
After that, we're talking about adjusting timing, food composition, and supplements when the gain is not coming because we can tweak those other factors to make our gains better, make them faster, make them slower and less fat prone, so on and so forth. Lastly, our last lecture, myths, myth conception, myth, myth conception, myth conceptions. It's really tough to say. Myths, misconceptions, and special circumstances in muscle gain. What if I'm playing another sport? How does muscle gain work? Is there a right time or is there a wrong time? And then we're going to talk about uh, various misconceptions that folks have, lean gains myth, all that stuff we're going to cover. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Holy crap. That's like eight slide, eight, eight courses we got, eight lectures or something. That's pretty crazy. Good stuff, folks. That's all I have for you today. We'll see you next time calories and macros for muscle gain. See you then.